Hi everyone, and welcome to a special edition of Incisions Journal Club. We're thrilled to have you join us for what promises to be an important and insightful discussion. I'm Angie, and I'm here with my colleague Law. How are you today, Law? Hey Angie, I'm doing great, thanks. I'm really excited to dive into today's topic, especially because it feels so relevant to the work we do here at Incision. The article we are discussing today, the Global Anesthesia Workforce Survey, Updates and Trends in Anesthesia Workforce. It highlights a lot of important issues around the anesthesia care globally, something that doesn't always get the attention it deserves. Absolutely. For those tuning in, the session today focuses on the important article published in Anesthesia and Analgesia. It presents updated data on the global anesthesia workforce, with a particular emphasis on disparities between HICs and LMICs. As many of you know, without a robust anesthesia workforce, surgical care is severely compromised. But before we dive deeper into the article, I want to take a moment to thank the World Federation of Societies of Anesthesiologists, WFSA, for their collaboration and support for our World Anesthesia Day campaign this year. Today's Journal Club is part of the broader Steady Minds, Steady Hands Workforce Wellbeing campaign, and we're so grateful for the WFSA's partnership in raising awareness about workforce wellbeing and anesthesia globally. Yes, definitely a big thank you to WFSA. They have been instrumental in promoting the importance of safe anesthesia care around the world. Now, back to the article. One of the key findings that stood out to me was the ongoing disparity in anesthesia workforce density. The article highlights that in the high income countries, the average density of anesthesia providers is about 20 per 100,000 population. But in the LMICs, it is often less than 5 per 100,000 population, which is the WHO minimum recommendation. Wow, that's a huge gap. The numbers alone paint such a stark picture of inequality in access to care. In fact, the article goes on to remind us about 5 billion people worldwide that lack access to safe surgical and anesthesia care, and this disproportionately affects people on LMICs. We're talking about millions of surgeries being delayed or performed without adequate anesthesia because of this workforce shortage. But I'm curious to know, what do you think can be done to start closing this gap? Yeah, it's a really tough challenge. I think part of the solution could be task shifting, which the article also mentioned. In some regions, non-physician providers such as the nurse and the studies are trained to take on the anesthesia responsibilities. This has worked in some settings, but it is not a perfect solution everywhere. There are issues with training qualities and also long-term sustainability. What's the take on this, Angie? And maybe the audience might like to expand on that in a Twitter question tomorrow. Let's pose it and see what people think. I agree. Task shifting can help fill the gaps, but it definitely has its challenges, especially in ensuring that the quality of care remains high. Another important aspect we can't overlook is retention. The article mentions that in LMICs, many anesthesia providers leave rural areas for better opportunities in urban centers or even other countries. This creates a cycle where even if we train more providers, they may not necessarily stay where they're needed the most. I'm curious to know, what do you think could help with retaining skilled providers in underserved regions? Retention is a big issue. Providers often face burnout and poor working condition, which push them to leave for better opportunities. I think improving the working condition and also career development opportunities could make a difference. Governments and the healthcare organization need to invest in not just in training, but also in keeping providers motivated to stay. This is a point we should definitely raise on Twitter tomorrow. What strategies could we use to retain providers in these underserved areas? What do you think, Angie? Should we put that out as Twitter question? Definitely. I think that's an important topic that our audience could really weigh in on. Another key issue the article brings up is the disparity in distribution of anesthesia providers, even within countries. Urban areas often have more resources, while rural and remote regions are left behind. This has a direct impact on patient outcomes, especially in emergency and trauma cases where anesthesia is critical within the golden hour. How can we address this imbalance in distribution? That's something we could explore well in the Twitter discussion. Absolutely. I think we should talk about the impact of anesthesia shortages on road traffic injuries. The article touches on this as well. Road accidents are the leading cause of trauma worldwide, especially in the LMICs. Without enough anesthesia providers, timely surgical interventions are difficult. What kind of policy do you think could help reduce the mortality associated with road traffic injuries in low-income countries, Angie? 
That's such a critical point. Evidence-based policies like improving pre-hospital care and having more anesthesia providers on hand in trauma centers are essential. But again, without the workforce to deliver that care, these policies are hard to implement. I think it's important to advocate for more investment in emergency medical systems, especially in places where road traffic injuries are common. We should definitely get the audience's thoughts on this tomorrow. Agree. And let's not forget about the importance of education and public awareness. The article highlights how public education, starting from the school age children, can play a huge role in preventing trauma and improving the first aid knowledge. If people are better educated, they can help stabilize trauma patients before they reach the hospitals. What's your take on this, Angie? That is so true. Education is key, and education can save lives. I think trauma prevention and first aid training should be integrated into school, curricula, and community programs worldwide. The audience might have some great ideas on how to expand education efforts, so let's put on that online as a question, too. How can we improve public awareness around anesthesia and trauma care? Yes, education is key, and we definitely need to hear more perspective on that. Lastly, I think we should touch on policy and advocacy. The article suggests that policy changes are essential to bridge the gap in anesthesia care. For instance, increasing resources for pre-hospital systems, advocating for better working conditions, and ensuring access to rehabilitation services are all areas that need attention. How do you think World Anesthesia Day can be used as a platform for policy change? Yep, World Anesthesia Day is a perfect opportunity to bring these issues to the forefront. It's a day where we can raise awareness, advocate for better policies, and call for global collaboration to improve trauma systems and anesthesia services worldwide. We can use it to encourage policymakers, healthcare organizations, and communities to make real changes. Right, and that's where we, as global health community, can come in. We can use data like this to advocate for better policies to their support anesthesia providers. By making the case with evidence from surveys like this one, we can push for the real change. That's part of what we hope to accomplish with tomorrow's discussion. That's exactly right. We're excited to get everyone's input and we'll be kicking off our Twitter slash X discussion tomorrow on October 17th. So here's how it's going to work. Today, we invite you all to read through the article and reflect on the key findings. And this will set the stage for tomorrow's live tweets, which we'll be posting throughout the day. We encourage you to jump in, share your thoughts, retweet, and engage with others as much as possible. Yes, the live tweet will be posted back-to-back to back tomorrow, October 17th, so keep an eye out. We will be asking you several questions based on article findings, and we want you to bring your experiences and insights to the conversation. You can use the hashtag TransitionJournalPub, hashtag WA24, and hashtag Anesthesia Wellbeing to join in. Take today to familiarize yourself with the article and get ready for some meaningful engagement tomorrow. Right. Let's make tomorrow's discussion active and insightful. Your input matters. Whether you're a student, provider, or advocate, we want to hear from all of you. And once the tweet starts coming tomorrow, keep refreshing your feed. Respond to questions and retweet ideas you find interesting. The more people are engaging, the better. We are excited to hear from everyone. Thanks, Law. And a final thank you again to WFSA for their collaboration and support for this important World Anesthesia Day campaign. We'll see you all tomorrow for the live Twitter discussion. And don't forget to use the hashtags Hashtag Incision Journal Club, hashtag WAD24, hashtag Well Anesthesia, and hashtag Incision for Global Surgery. We hope to see you all tomorrow for a meaningful and impactful conversation. Mm-hmm.